being recorded. Hooray. And we are entering our distance learning session. As the thing fires up, you are recording this meeting. Be sure to let everyone know they are being recorded. I mentioned this earlier, but consent in play is so important. Do not force someone to play a game against their will. That phrase, I want to play and I do not want to play, is the like the predisposition or the pre, I guess, the pre-existing condition for why we are allowed to play in the first place. How play works. If you were to play a, a game like golf and the simple rule is to get the ball in the hole, well, there's a lot of different ways we can make that happen. If you wanted to, you can just literally pick the ball up, walk it all the way down to that cup and just drop it in, right? But we agree before we play that game that that's not the way that we play golf. And the philosopher Bernard Suits wrote in the 1970s that games are a voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. And what that means is there's a volition there, there's an agency, there's a consent. And that's so important, not just in school, but in all matters of life. Consent, consent, consent. No one should be forced to do anything that they do not feel comfortable with. No one should be forced to act against their bodily autonomy if they do not feel comfortable. Ableism is uncool. We should not make games that just make students race against each other like the Hunger Games. And they're trying to kill each other for the one point that everyone has to, you know, have the survival of the fittest so that only one can stand on top of the mountain. Our goal is to create classrooms that are safe and supported, that are driven by feedback and consent, that students have agency and autonomy, choice and voice, and they feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves. And today we're gonna have a chance to dive in, show some templates, play in the game, um, and you can grab copies of all of these resources on my website, which is www.edrenalinrush.com. I got this here on the shirt. I promise this will be the last time I try to sell you anything today, except if you wanted a copy of the book, which is like how to do this stuff. Ooh, ah. <gasps> AdrenalineRush.com is available. Uh, Adrenaline and Rush is a book that's available from Dave Burgess Consulting. It's all about game-changing student engagement inspired by theme parks, mud runs, and escape rooms. So that's available for you on the internet. You can check out the first couple chapters for free. And let's hang out. Let's talk about it. Um, any questions you all have, like I said, my resources are all there for you. Take them, remix them, respin them, do whatever you want with them. Just let me know how they go. Um, I'm going to show you my screen right now, and I'm going to use that for the remainder of today's presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you for saying nice things over there, too. Um, I promise I didn't pay anybody um, or your checks are in the mail. Um, <laughs> but let's get into it. I'm going to put it up here. You're going to see my entire screen presently. Um, it's going to be a weird sort of matrix thing because you're going to see my screen inside of your screen. Um, if you can see on the right-hand side that meeting chat that I am seeing, can you just go ahead and say, yep, or yes, I see it, um, just so I can make sure that uh, this is in fact working. Because right at this point, we should have people seeing the screen. Erica says yes, Emily says yes, Dave yeah. says yes. So say you, so say we all. All right, let's get into it then. We are now jumping into our presentation and I'm gonna do the worst teacher in the world thing where I um, just ask you to mute and you're um, not allowed to say words out loud because otherwise we're talking to each other. But please, please, please fire up that chat on the right hand side. I'm all in to help anything I can, and I promise I will stay late after the hour and answer every single question that is posted in the next 60 minutes. Um, we'll go about 60 minutes, but again, if you find that you need to Irish goodbye for any reason, I will not take it personally. I am Irish, I do these goodbyes all the time. It is your time, consent, consent, consent. So let's hang out until you can't hang out anymore, and then you can bounce. But right now I wanna fire up our, uh, our presentation for distance learning to get you excited to change the game, even if you're not in the physical classroom. So let's do this one here. Which one is this one? Me oh my. Okay, here we go. Making sure that that's it. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. I had this pulled up earlier. Let's go distance learning here. Oh. Uh -huh, uh -huh. All right. So wow, 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 wow. Yes. All right. Perfect. So. Thank you again for talking about distance learning, ways to change the game, even if we're not in our physical classroom. Again, my name is John, and I'm excited to be here hanging out with you, um, talking about ways to get students excited, safe, and supported, even if they are not in our physical classrooms. Um, a bit about the science of play and the psychology of play before we get started. Um, there's a great saying in, a, in Finland. They say that the things you learn without joy, you will forget easily. And I love that sense of community and collaboration that happens in the physical classroom. Students coming together and laughing together, learning together being a part of a team together, working with people who have different ages or sexualities, different genders, different races, different backgrounds. You see all these smiling faces come together because there is no Pokemon achievement gap, right? Black and white kids, rich and poor kids, gay and straight kids, old and young kids get together and they say, as long as I'm good at this game, I can be anything that I need to be. I can be anything that I am in my life and the game does not judge me for being any of these things. I have my students here at O'Connell and the best part about my job is I get to hang out with 
uh, people and talk about what I love all day. The challenge is when I'm not with them in person, how can I get them to love it the same way, right? Here they are laughing together and enjoying things, playing games like with Legos or oversized board games or, 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 or dress up, right? You can see this, kind of, this, this scene here where students are doing that. Um, this picture in the bottom I love, um, this is Eddie. Um, you can see by his muscles and by his shaker bottle here that he's an athlete. Uh, he plays baseball and he's gonna be drafted for Major League Baseball this year. He's actually one of the top 200 players in the country. Um, and that's Chase right next to him. Chase is really excited to be there right next to him. It looks like they're on the same team. But high school is really clicky. In fact, Chase is a music student. And when I see these two students hanging out in my classroom laughing together, Chase cracking a joke and Eddie enjoying it, typically in high school, there's like very strong groups that sort of diverge from one another. And so the challenge is, how do I get those kids who are dissimilar to see those similarities, to laugh together, to come together, to play together? That's what distance learning misses out on so many times, right? Because now these students are laughing with one another and they're becoming friends. And they're saying, hey, I miss you today, Chase. Where were you? Or Eddie. How about that baseball game? Chase doesn't care about baseball so much, but he cares about Eddie. And Eddie sees that the class is fundamentally different because he showed up today, because he understands the value of being a good team player. So in the bottom left-hand side, when you see this here, in school, I have that energy, that excitement where kids are throwing their hands up, competing against other sections. Did we beat the third period class on the high score or something like that? How can we recapture that same joy in a classroom that's not in a physical location? Well, I think that's important to think about um, and I'm going to throw back to something else that I did that the internet was able to help me capture. Um, I lead trainings like this all over the United States um, when I'm not in school. Uh, in, the, in the 12 weeks before Corona, I was in 20 different states in the U.S. Um, and I lead teacher trainings. If you afterwards want to hang out, we can, we can talk about it. I can come to your school virtually or whatever we can do to help teachers um, change the game, too. But I posted a thing afterwards where I gave a training. And I called it the Egg Dash Challenge. You might have seen it online. I was giving a training and I asked people to cut up a worksheet. Um, with numbered problems. Took those worksheet problems and then just put them into different Easter eggs and then put them in a bucket. Teachers then broke up into teams and then put one member of their team said, okay, send them forward, grab an egg from the bucket, back to your desk group they go. Um, when you get it back to your desk group, open the egg, solve that numbered problem, whichever one you have, and then rinse and repeat again and again and again. How many can you solve before five minutes or 10 minutes runs out? I took that video and posted it online. In a Overnight, it had 10,000 views. And in a month, it had over 75,000 views. So people started doing this egg dash challenge inspired by the video all over the United States. And that was so cool because I was like, this is an idea that works in any classroom. We all have a dumb day where we have to work on worksheets, right? Littles or middles or adult learners. And I started to see spinoff videos or takes on the video, twists on the video that spread not only through the United States, but all over the world in a month. 75,000 views and 40 out of 50 US states were uh, doing egg dash challenges. I had people in Canada, six provinces in Canada were doing egg dash challenges. And then I started to see the universal language of play expanding beyond our borders. Like we had people here from Croatia and Austria. I saw 12 countries in the course of a month who had um, like in, in Australia, in France, in the United Kingdom, different twists on the same activity. I said, well, that's it, right? This is a game that anybody can play. You don't actually need plastic Easter eggs. You can do it with balls, paper, or little envelopes. The rule is simple. Take a thing and cut it into parts. When you have the right answer on any one of those parts, you get to trade it in and try the next thing. And again and again and again, rinse and repeat. How many can you score before time expires? That is very constructive. It's actually a very Montessori method, which is work on whatever you want to work on until you're done working on it, until you've met that threshold, until you've got that binary state of you're good to go. Once you have it, you move forward and you start working on something else. So there's always new learning there. I have it for you a test, even if we're in distance learning right now. I'm gonna ask you to uh, push your screens here if you could. Um, I realize it's not a touchpad, but just play along if we could. Uh, this, this test I, I borrowed from um, an engineer, uh, his name is Mark Rober. He gave a fantastic TED talk. And he says, let's take the same activity we just talked about and talk about why it works, the science behind it, the brain science behind it. Here, I wanna take this uh, keypad on the left. I'm gonna ask you to push button three for five seconds. After that, if you can push button six for one second, then buttons three and five and six for a second and so on and so forth and so forth, right? He says, um, it's actually a 90 page test. In order to get to page two, you have to have 100% completion on page one. Well, that's not easy. So here's our question. How much would I have to pay you to take this test? Maybe that doesn't sound so exciting. But what if we gave it a new coat of paint? Maybe we called it a, a test, we called it a game. Now it's not a great game right now, it's still 100% completion on page one to get to page two, and you have to get all 90 pages right before you pay, beat the game. But maybe if we took this game and just presented it in a clever way, maybe turned it on its head, right? 
a new coat of paint turned on its head is not so different than taking a worksheet and cut into slips. Now we're starting to present a little bit of curiosity, like take a worksheet and tape it to the bottom of a desk. Now suddenly you're scientists or your archaeologists laying on your back in a cave trying to figure out all the answers of how to spelunk or how to learn the artwork on the Sistine Chapel. Well, now our imagination's kicking in. There's a little bit of creativity to it. Maybe we can give that coat of paint over here to those buttons as well. Rearrange their configuration so it has a little bit of variety, a little bit of choice to it there. And we cover them up. So now we don't realize that we're taking our medicine, right? It feels here comes the airplane. And now we take that which was otherwise a written prompt and present it in a visual manner as well. This is the same game. In order to get to level two, you have to beat level one exactly right, 100%. And you have to run and jump and do it again and again and again and again. Ask that same question then. How much would I have to pay you to take this test? Or better yet, how much would you pay me? Because for the past 40 years, kids have grown up throwing good money after bad to play video games, which are creating a system of what they call hard fun. Whether you live in Croatia, whether you live in Austria, whether you live in Topeka, Kansas, Everyone is given the same Mario Brothers game. And the rules are there in a rule book, but most people don't even read the rule book. They just start playing. They run until they fall in a pit. And once they fall in a pit, they get a new man, they get a new life, and they have a chance to try and try again. Video games are infinitely patient and infinitely stupid. And during our lockdown time, our kids are playing a ton of them, leveling up their skills and abilities in all disparate realms. So how can we get kids to do that and feel safe and supported when they're failing in games like Fortnite or Mario Kart. But when they get to math class, they get one question wrong and they say, oh, I'm not a math student. How do we take that asynchronous model and that joy, that clever presentation like an Easter eggs hidden hunt and say, you can do this any planet, any country, any kid. I wanna talk about what games do and this is what we have to tap into for the psychological underpinnings of why distance learning needs to be rethought. Games. Whether you're talking about uh, physical games, talking about games that are based on consent, board games, or video games, are rooted in this fundamental idea that you can play, you can try, you can fail, and you can try again. Creates an underpinning of a sense of psychological safety. And I hit that phrase a lot today. It's a good acronym, and I'd like to use it because if you have a PD, you probably should get a good acronym. So here it is. Games of all types are precision engineered feedback machines. They offer specific, actionable feedback expediently. Not three weeks later do you find out that Mario didn't make his way across that pit, literally in that spot. You try, you die, you either succeed or you fail again. That's how the game is played, specific actionable feedback expediently. So what games do is to create a psychological sense that I will learn immediately that I am either right or I need to keep going. It expedites that feedback in a way that traditional classes do not, because otherwise you get a stack of essays every second Friday or every third Wednesday. And all those essays have the same mistake on page one that they had on page 10. Because if a student made that mistake on page one, they're gonna keep making those mistakes on page 10. And then we have that stack of things and we carry it home in our teacher bag and we kind of resent the kids and we kind of resent that process. And we have it, we bring it home and we maybe have a bottle or two or four of red wine and we say, oh, I hate this stupid grind. And that's what happens. We wait to that last minute. Those deadlines pile up on us and we spend the whole weekend. Hey, I can't come out tonight, guys. Why? I'm grading papers. Especially in a time of a pandemic or a shutdown, that's really painful to sit there and say, I don't want to wake up today because I have to do all of this grading. So what if you replace this behavior management and this compliance system with a system that was specific actionable feedback? Micromanaging is replaced by micro-credentialing or micro-badging. This science comes to us from antiquity, believe it or not. Um, there's a fantastic German philosopher, um, for those who speak German. Uh, his name is Josef Pieper. He passed away um, you know, maybe about 15, 20 years ago. Um, he is the reason why the Catholic tradition, my family is Catholic and my church, my school is Catholic. Um, um, he's, a, he's a major scholar on St. Thomas Aquinas, um, which is a major uh, reason why the Catholics even know of things like the Socratic method and the stories of Aristotle, because Aquinas really does like a Catholic spin on those things. So he's a big deal. Um, and in his book, Leisure, The Basis of Culture, which is not a teaching book, it's a philosophy book, he points out rightly that the word leisure itself, where we go back to its root, comes to us from the Greek word skole, um, Latin, the word scala. Literally, the English word school is used to designate a place where we educate and teach. It comes from a word that means leisure. Pieper calls it the basis of culture, rather than being a part of what he calls the work a day world, where it's the things that we have to do. Leisure is the thing that we get to do. And the basis of our culture is why we fight wars, right? To defend our way of life, not our right to go back to work. Rather, it's our right to spend time with our families, to draw, 
to paint, to sing, to love. Leisure is the thing that we get to do. You're talking about Netflix, or you're talking about um, uh, video games. Nobody's sitting down and forcing you to watch Tiger King. You get to do that. And you get to do it in your free time and you unwind with it. So how can we create a classroom that then feels more like that same leisure escape, that binge learning that we happen in times away from a traditional classroom? Now, I have a quiz for you. And this one, you really will have a chance to take part in the quiz. Um, this one comes to me uh, from a, a book uh, called The Game Believes in You, How Digital Play Can Make Our Kids Smarter by the amazing Greg Topo. He's currently uh, living in Dubai, but he spent uh, the better part of 20 years working as the national K-12 education reporter for USA Today. Um, some of us had a chance to meet Greg in person um, at the Summer Sandbox at O'Connell High School. Um, he's a great friend and an amazing journalist. If you don't have a chance, please read his book, follow him on Twitter, he is brilliant. Um, he talks about the intersection of play and learning. And he went on to become the managing editor at the Inside of Higher Education magazine. So he knows his stuff. Um, but he says, interestingly, that games and technology are only called technology if you were born before that thing was created, right? You know, if we're born today and the kids get a new Nintendo, we say, oh, yeah, that's a new technology. Like the new Nintendo Switch, the new game for the Xbox, the new PlayStation that's coming out. That's a technology. But if the technology was created before your lifetime, we don't call that a technology. We call it a tool. He uses the example of the piano um, as a case study. And he says pianos are a binary feedback machine, much like a video game. They are infinitely patient and infinitely stupid. Mozart learned how to play the piano by pushing buttons. If you push the right button, you got the right sound. Push the wrong button, and he got a feedback that says, Ugh, that didn't sound the way I wanted to. But it gave him a chance to play again and again and again. No one who's born today would look at a piano and be like, oh, what a fancy newfangled technology. But for the people who were born when the piano was uh, invented, it was exactly that. Video games and musical, musical instruments work very similarly because they are specifically done, designed to tell you, you either got it, keep going, or Oop, didn't quite get that one, give it another shot. What Topper talks about in his book is how video games are designed and the psychology behind why they work. So I wanna talk quickly with a pop quiz for everybody. And some of us who have been a part of my sessions earlier this week, I have given this quiz a few times. I do apologize for any re redundancy. Um, but when they design a game, they want it to be hard, but not too hard, right? There's an old saying in video games, they call it hard fun. Um, hard fun means I don't like it when this game is hard, but I don't like it more when this game is not hard. If the game's too easy when you play it, you don't want to play it because everyone wins. It's like if you walked to a casino and said, push here to win, there's no payout, right? If the game is too hard, however, and I'm sure maybe if your house is like me, I saw someone named Jeremy, maybe it's my brother who dialed in, um, I can tell you that if it's too hard, we take the controller and we throw it across the room. So I want to ask this question, and you can fire up the chat on the side to uh, hazard your guesses or your answers. Um, on a scale of 0% failure to 100% failure, when they design a game with what they call old school difficulty, um, there's actually a graduate studies out of University of Michigan that does a ton of research about how games are designed and the psychology of game design. Um, what do they want that failure rate to be? If 0% is first time you play it, everyone will pass. And 100% failure is first time you play it, everyone will fail. What do we think that intended rate of failure is when we design a video game um, for a traditional audience in an old school difficulty? I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to look at the screen and I'll take a look at what you got. Go ahead and fire up that chat. Let's see, let's see. Old school games were tough. I'm seeing people saying, oh my gosh, you're testing my memory, Jessica says. Oh yeah, hey Jess, you're, you're from uh, uh, Annandale High School. Yeah, we, we, we hung out last summer. Erica has a very specific thing, 87.5. Uh, um, Marty says 100% failure. Wow, oof, oh, man, this is crazy. You guys are, you guys are tough. Sean says 33%, Jeremy says 60%, Tina says 90, 100, 100, 100, uh, 68%. Someone says $1, that's ridiculous. Uh, it increases with each level to get us hooked. Ooh, you're, like you're reading my mind. We'll talk about that momentarily. Um, so NES hard, uh, that's the old school one here. I've yet to pass a level in one video game. So ooh, let's see about it here. Um, actual retail price without going over here. Let me see some examples of, all right, let me get this in. Um, the actual retail price. Uh, I'm going to mirror my screen again. Let's do it. I'm going to mirror my screen. I don't want to give it away. I don't want to give it away. All right, mirror the screen. Here we go. Mirror that screen. Increases with difficulties. Actually.
actual retail price without going over. My screen should now be up again. Can somebody say that they've seen the screen? Just make sure you do have it. You see it? Just say yes. Maybe. All right. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Um, this is way more elegant when we do it in person. I apologize. And thank you again for your, your flexibility here. Um, we are here. Actual retail price without going over. Ooh. Present from this slide. Ooh. Oh, oh, all right. Actual retail price without going over. Here we go. 80%. Some of you guys are dead on the money, which is crazy when you think about it, right? Video games are designed to break you down, to make it feel like you are um, supposed to fail because they were designed to steal your quarters. They were designed to be people in Japan built these guys, then sent them to the United States and didn't touch them. So the game itself was a specific feedback machine designed to say, you got it. Well, almost got it. That sense of failure is actually what drives you to want to play again and again, like Candy Crush. It'll hook you in. As we talk about micro-credentialing and now micro-transactions, new video games will let you pay a dollar each time to get a few more coins to beat that level, an extra man, an extra life. And what it does is it hooks your attention and it actually can hook your money. Believe it or not, the psychology from this comes from um, the same reasons why people find themselves addicted to um, all, all manner of things. Those dopamine centers in their brain, brain are flooding with all of these positive endorphins. And uh, there's a fantastic researcher named Mihai Chiksin Mihai. Um, I might quiz you on how to spell that one later. And he talks about uh, a science called uh, positive psychology. He says that games are fantastic ways to get us in colloquially what's called the flow state. It's up here in this document here in this chart. Um, that's that moment of fully immersed feeling of energized focus, full involvement and enjoyment in the process of activity where time simultaneously speeds up and slows down. You probably have hit the flow state yourself if you've ever played a game where we say, hey, time, time flies when you're having fun, right? If you have a st student or a child of your own, you might have them hear them say, mom, one more level, one more man, just like get to the next save point. Hold on, I just got to level 16, right? When you hit that flow state, time speeds up and slows down. You forget to take care of pretty much everything else but that thing that you are doing. You might forget to eat or sleep. I was writing this morning until 3.30. I was on a run and I was just loving it. I was like, oh man, I have so many ideas. Boom, 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 boom. They look at the clock and you're like, whoa, it's been a minute here, right? That flow state, you might even forget to take out the garbage or use the bathroom. Maybe when you lesson plan, you hit that flow state and you just geek out and then you realize, wow, I've planned for two weeks or two months. And there's an excitement that comes from it. There's a joy. Because what the game is doing is ramping up its difficulty level, here the challenge on the left, as much as it's ramping up your skill level. If your skill is low, but the challenge is high, you feel a sense of anxiety. And that's a lot of students where that consent comes in. They do not feel safe in your class because they do not want to be in your class. They're required to be in your class. So they walk in feeling, I'm dumb, this class is hard, equals anxiety. But if they're too smart for it, right? Or if they think that they're overqualified for it, then the challenge is low. Well, now you have a student who feels relaxed, maybe bored or apathetic. The challenge, and this is what great games do, and this is why gambling addiction works the way it does, is to flood those dopamine centers with more and more challenges while you're getting more and more skills. So you have a sense of control and arousal, this sweet spot of that flow state. And the psychology behind that works whether you live in the United States, whether you live in Canada, whether you're male or female, old or young, gay or straight. And I want to talk about ways that I've adapted uh, some distance learning tools for that same sense when we are away from the classroom. And I want to take a moment here, zip out of this slide, and then pull up the next ones so I can get to the same. Talking about distance learning here, where is my button that's the one that says present? Because it's always present from this slide, and I do it from the wrong way. One moment. I'm so sorry. Here's a present slideshow, present from this slide. Present from this slide, from this slide, hooray. All right, so we talked about the science behind how games are designed. I wanna deep dive into some real clear concrete examples of distance learning and how we can adapt that same strategy of those egg dashes, those Easter eggs or the video game design, whether you're in school or you're at home. Capturing that same energy that students come in excited, like our marathoners here. Some of you all might be marathoners and if you are, uh, I, I welcome and, I, and I, I'm looking forward, we can talk afterwards about any tips to get better at it. Um, because it's not a race against anybody, right? It's a race against yourself. But those cheering fans on the sideline and that spirit of seeing yourself as, hey, I am a runner. Simply by putting on running clothes, you start to believe the enclosed cognition that you are part of that team. Everyone is a writer. You just might not be an author yet. Sitting down to write, you start to believe yourself, right? Whether you're running or writing, whether you're Netflix binging, I'm a fan of TV show X. You create these affinity circles where you say, 
I am like this thing. And because I am like this thing, I can go the distance on behalf of that thing. How do we do it in our classrooms? I want to talk about some examples of things that I've adapted. Again, these are all uh, templates, um, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint. Uh, you can do Google Slides templates. They're available on my website at adrenalinerush.com. So I want to talk about some game-based ideas that hopefully can help you get to that same um, finish line, metaphorically. Um, we're currently fighting a worldwide pandemic. It's terrifying. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet to play the board game Plandemic, it's brilliant. Uh, it, in it, we work not against one another, but as collaborating teams of scientists and researchers trying to bring the fight to these global outbreaks. They keep popping up like whack-a-mole all over the planet. So you have people in Belgium, people in uh, Boston, people in Buffalo, and people all the way down in Atlanta where the CDC is. And they say, uh-oh, there's a hot spot here in Wuhan. We have to move people over there. But be careful, because we need the resources over here in London. And boom, 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 connecting and planning and strategizing. It's a fantastic game. And I've done a bunch of them on Zoom calls. I have a friend, uh, Matt Hill, he's a science teacher. And um, he and I will dial in. I had some friends uh, from Texas. We dialed in from Houston. Uh, Jason Howes, I don't know if he's on the call. He dialed in from Quebec. And we just set up a Zoom because we're all playing the same game, right? Like checkers, uh, we can show the board and say, okay, where do we move to next? And we move together and make those plans. And it's been fascinating and it's been fun. And in this moment where we're learning about the pandemic, it does help us feel a sense of connectivity, even though the world is desperate and maybe kind of scary right now. So I'll present my students the same idea. This is a game uh, I call a QR break-in, but I've themed it for distance learning. Because what I find about escape rooms is they're great at the end of the unit, but I want to break into new content. I want to use it not as a review activity, not like a Jeopardy game, but rather as a teaching tool. In this case, I designed it for science classes, so it's, uh, I'm glad to see that there are some science teachers here. But you can quickly use it and reskin it or change the guts to make it whatever game you need for yourself. But that same met methodology of grab the Easter egg, take it back to your desk group when you think you have it right, call me over. Here's our story so far. Again, tapping into that imagination. The world needs your help. A devastating crisis has hurled our planet into a time of unprecedented global crisis to quote Alexander Hamilton, that's true. And this outbreak will challenge your ability to work remotely to contain this emergency and stop it from spreading a deadly disease before it's too late. To bring the fight to the pandemic, you'll need to discover everything that you can about this invisible enemy as you master eight different distance learning challenges or techniques. Are you up to the challenge? Stay alert and stay safe out there. We're counting on you. I wanna pause here real quick and talk about that there are some games that are not appropriate for school, especially simulation games. Some simulations put students in the place of people and ask them to empathize with. And that's why we see so many people creating these simulations or these scenarios where they're doing like an underground railroad simulation or a Holocaust simulation. And I cannot stress enough, especially as a person who is white, taking someone's trauma and making light of it should never be the fodder for a game. If I was to do a pandemic game, for example, the natural low hanging fruit is to say, okay, can you stop this from dying? How many people won't die or minimize human casualties? I don't want to make light of the fact that we have over 130,000 human beings in the United States who've passed away and well more beyond that on an international scale. What I do want to do is talk about a pandemic in a way that feels safe for these students so that we don't make this a cheap bulletin board with a, with a body count. Um, because in the world, I think we really have gamified that where we're sort of rooting to see which state has the highest death rates every day or which nation has the highest outbreaks. But rather, we are working together to help solve this crisis and the way that we solve this crisis to become educated and become informed. So we're never making light of other people's trauma. There's that saying again, that hurt people hurt people. And if you can't transform your trauma, you will transmit it. So I think it's very important to say that before we get any further into any of the activities we're talking about for distance learning. That said, slide two, I'll send out and I'll say, hey, okay guys, now we are watching for other outbreaks, so please stay alert. There are eight quote containment challenges that you're welcome to tackle in any order that you'd like to. But be careful because each zone may be infected with some hidden outbreaks. Please take your time as you explore each region. This will be a micro Microsoft PowerPoint slide deck I'll send to all students in the class on the first week of class. It's a brand new unit where they have to learn about the pandemic, for example, for a science class here. Each time they individually as a student feel safe that they've answered that question, that zone containment challenge, there has its specific instructions necessary to quote, contain the virus. It basically is the checkpoint. When I think they have it, they shoot me a quick message, they post to our LMS head of and I think I got station two or station seven. And if they fall short of the target in that pandemic zone, they have to submit again and again and again, so as to stop the spread of the virus. They're welcome to move in any order that they want to, but be careful because if you make mistakes, you have to try and try again, which will cost you precious seconds of time. So in this case, this themed activity has eight different themed stations. They bounce between um, a station where they grab the microscope, 
or whether they grab an extra toilet paper while they watch the stock market, while they see uh, outbreaks, or they grab the PPE, while they learn how to wash their hands, airports and contagions, et cetera, et cetera. And the way it works is I'll say, all right, I don't care which one you do first. You now have home access to all eight slides at once. In this case, this is the Flipgrid station where they earn the hand wash badge. And the hand wash badge, in order to earn the hand wash badge, I send them a link to a website called washyourlyrics.com. Ask them to take a look at Wash Your Lyrics and to put in the lyrics of a song that they love. I don't care whether it's Lizzo or if it's uh, the Black Eyed Peas or if it's Bruce Springsteen or David Bowie. Um, put in the lyrics of a song that you love or click, 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 automatically it does it for you. And it'll make for you a printed uh, sheet of how to wash your hands to the tune of that, uh, that famous song. So make a short flip grid, which is an awesome Microsoft tool. Um, totally free for educators where you just film 30 second video or a minute long video showing me how you properly wash your hands, right? This is great for like a sixth grade audience or a fifth grade audience. It feels fun. Maybe they pick, you know, some sort of crazy song off the wall that I've never heard of. I get to learn about a little bit of new music as long as it's school appropriate. They make their short video. They think they have it. They take it and turn it in. And I start to see my flip grid filling up in the background. That's awesome. Along the way, students feel empowered and safe. And this is what real world education is, right? It's consent to say, oh, I know how to play this game and I can play it safely. Hang on, I wanna keep playing, I wanna lean in. They complete it, they send me that Flipgrid and I start to see them in, I check it off, check it off and they keep going. Or maybe someone else wants to work on the YouTube video. This one was called the Jet Setter Badge. It talked about the fact that our airports were so crowded as we talk about things like returning to schools, that crowd, that sense of contagion as people are lined up waiting to be properly screened to get through that checkpoint can create unnecessary funnel points where people start to get sick. So I say, okay, watch the video and uh, let me know what you see based on those enhanced screenings. Write down 10 things from this YouTube video that stand out most to you. I just grabbed a news story. Students, I don't know what they're going to write down, but that's okay because that one-on-one -on -one feedback can come in whatever form I need to. They send it in, nice work, but I think you were a little weak here on number three. And because they know I'm going to be looking at it and they won't get to work on the next station until I worked on it, right? They put in the work, they send it in an LMS, or they send it in an email, it's fantastic. I then take a look and I say, all right guys, based on what I'm seeing here, I have a spreadsheet, I can post this up on our website or on our school's LMS, or if I wanted to, I could just have it in a notebook for myself and start to get a vibe on which students are racing ahead and which students might be falling behind. So in this case, I see Wendy is crushing it. She has four stations done. Maybe they had all week to complete all eight stations. And by Wednesday, I noticed, okay, Wendy seems like she's on the right pace. Three days in, four stations, good to go. I shoot her a quick note, form letter. Nice work, student X, you're crushing it. You have X of Y stations complete. Keep it up, great job. That's a simple bulk message you can send out to eight, 10, 20 kids at a time. Meanwhile, I can see on this bottom here, I use the characters from South Park and I use the characters from uh, The Simpsons. Homer is our example of a classic student who's having a hard time getting the work done. Homer, in this case, by Wednesday, only has one item done. It looks like it's the biohazard badge. Okay, fine, I'll shoot him a message and say, hey, Homer, I can't help but notice we're four days into the week. I'm only seeing one thing from you. Are you good? Anything I can do to help, right? That's a form letter. It's very compassionate. It creates that safe environment that says, I'm presuming positive intent. I hope you're okay. Let's talk about it. What can we do to help get you out of that stuck spot? And that's great because then that micromanagement doesn't need to happen. Rather, again, it's micro checkpoints doing the job for me because each of these things is either completed to 100% or not so much. And I have a chance to practice and move and do it again and again and again and again. I love that idea of that pandemic. And in the classroom, I've done all those different variants of it. This is another example, which I have on my website, um, where we were working with Lieutenant Henry from the uh, Farewell to Arms. It's a, a Ernest Hemingway book. And it was about a character who was injured in World War I. Um, there was an explosion. His, uh, his leg was, was injured with shrapnel. So I said, all right, let's do this. Um, let's make a game in class where we have to help him in an operation um, because all these different items have sort of blasted into his body. So as they work on like the Flipgrid station, they have to solve the wishbone because he has a wish to get out of the war or whatever it looks like. Or when they talk about his wrenched ankle where his leg hurts, they have to maybe complete an online quiz. These are just an example of the type of modular activities that I've rolled in. And I have 12 here, but you can use any combination that you feel comfortable with. Google Forms could just easily be Microsoft Forms, right? Uh, a WebQuest can just easily be a YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. A Sketchnote can be, uh, you know, a, just an email to the teacher. An Edpuzzle can be a quizzes, et cetera. And they work together or they work apart to solve these stations. In class, rather than having it as an individual activity, I did it as a team activity. Anytime they solved a small thing, they had a bonus mini game where they could approach the physical board you see here on the bottom right, and they could pull out any of those items to try to score bonus points for their teams. 
that sense of dopamine, that adrenaline, that excitement says in three minutes, in seven minutes, you're going to have a chance to play another one. Keep going because each of these modular centers, how many can you get done? You see here on the board, we're checking off each of these and then students are working up front. They're not focused on the grade. They're focused on the learning because the only way to get the good grade, the 100% completion, is to do the learning to 100% completion. If you focus on the learning, the grade comes as a natural consequence. If you focus on the grade, the learning will suffer because all they want to do is get that carrot or fear that stick. So I want to talk about use that distance learning model that most of us probably did over the past six weeks or more. Um, I use this as my launch to the, the distance learning plan. I said, guys, we're going to be doing a lot of Netflix. You're going to be hanging out on your couch, doing a lot of binge watching of your favorite TV shows. So what if we turned our English class into a giant binge worthy series on Netflix? I had to scrap some things. I had to change some things. I could not do a traditional novel study because what I found is the average student might not read at the same pace as everybody else. If you watch Netflix, you probably watch Tiger King at a very different pace than the person next to you, whether it's 2 a.m. or 3 in the afternoon or over the course of several days when you're having pizza or when you're working out. And there's nothing we agree on except for we all watched the same type of stuff and that Carol Baskin killed her husband. But other than that, it's really up to you to move through that at any pace that you like. So I found a template online um, to make a logo. And I said, I'm going to call this instead of Netflix, I'm going to call it Edflix. I copied and pasted that logo here into a black slide deck that I then submitted to them via uh, Google Slides or, or Microsoft PowerPoint. And I said, let's do this. I want you to make an edit to this template that tells me the story of what you're binge learning about. And I'm gonna give an example right here. Mine, selfishly, uh, is a plug for my book. I said, I love theme parks, I love mud runs, and I love escape rooms. So I whipped up a quick template of, I just put my pictures here in a few text boxes. And I said, all right, if I was binge learning about what I would get educated about in the next six weeks, I'd write a sequel to Adrenaline Rush. In the pilot episode, we talk about what happens when we put teachers together. Then we do two or three teachers getting messy, getting their hands dirty. We talk about escape rooms, uh, theme parks. We talk about how to change the game in education. That's my quote brand. And I'd be really excited to watch that series. In fact, if I watched that series and I binged it real quick, like an hour, two hours, three hours, I can't wait to see. Netflix says, are you still watching? Of course I'm still watching, I wanna see more. On the bottom it says, you might also like, what I put there is links to I don't know, Walt Disney World or Disneyland, Tough Mudder, Spartan races, escape rooms, class trips, things that I'm interested in. What I did there is actually create sort of an annotated bibliography, right? Like, hey, I love this thing. If I love this thing, I probably also would love those things. I then gave this template to my students and I said, what do you love? If you could spend the next six weeks learning about whatever you wanted to, what would it be? Make a binge worthy TV show for you. I gave them the link to the logo generator and I sent them an editable copy of the template. Here's some examples of the things my students have turned out. This is Mira's uh, website, which she called Mira the Temporary Vegan. Um, through the quarantine, she decided she would be totally vegan. Um, it was also Lent, so she had given up meat for Lent and were Catholic. And she started making a series of YouTube videos on her own website because students started making either a website or a blog or a vlog where, or a podcast series where they were just telling me what they were working on. This is their kickoff. Okay, so what do you care about? I want to talk about how to be a vegan, how to, have a, how to take over the kitchen, how to learn grandma's uh, recipes, how to have box foods or frozen foods. She's excited to do it. And you can see the look on her face, right? the joy, the excitement. When they're working for an audience that is just the teacher, they're working until it's only good enough. But if they're working for an audience that they feel is authentic, the real world, now students will work till it's good. There's something binge worthy about that. They feel that adrenaline. They feel that excitement. They feel that flow state. And so she's like, to inspire my videos, I watched a bunch of other YouTubers. She put links down here, and if I roll over it, you can see it. Those are YouTube channels that she used to inspire the type of blog that she aspired to make. She found out very quickly that to make a two minute YouTube video takes you about three and a half hours. And she was like, wow, I never realized this is a lot of work. And after the first one, I was like, this is great. Have you thought about music? After the second one, I was like, that's good. Have you thought about video editing? And boom, 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 boom. There's such a marked difference between the first video and the last video over the course of the six weeks, because over the course of the six week assignment, I said, guys, I don't care what you're working on. I just want you to keep telling me, communicate to me, let me know. As an English class, I have flexibility with that, but you can just as easily do that in a civics class. Hey, lean into what we're seeing with the news stories, make a website about, make a project about, make a Minecraft world where, I mean, kind of let their brains be the imagination behind it. And because they look forward to this challenge, they wake up every day wanting to hit it and run with it. Netflix template was amazing and it was used for all sorts of stuff from students all throughout my, uh, my, my, my classes. This one's from a student named Roman. 
he called his fit flicks because he wanted to get swole, bro. He talked about this intersection between sports and spirituality. And so what he did is he looked up all of these people and all of these exercises to help strengthen his physical resolve, but also his prayer life outside of school. This is a fantastic way to think about the type of thing that this cares about, kid cares about. I knew he was always like the athletic sporty type in class, but I got to see another side of him through his writing. He wasn't just the one dimensional jock, you know, but dismissed, like I said about Eddie earlier, right? Oh, he plays sports, so he must not have, you know, too much in this vested in school interest. Quite on the contrary, he sees sports as his avenue to college. And he talks about how he's strengthening himself and has preparing himself. He's posting videos of his different workouts and what's inspiring him. He's talking about things that he loves. And I can give individual feedback, which again, micro credentials, nice work this time. Versus micromanagement, which is everyone must do an X, a Y, or a Z. And I can give on the spot feedback. Hey, nice work. Your paragraph structure is good, but you are making some spelling errors. Double check that before next time. Because he knows he's being seen, not just by me, but by his friends, he puts in the work and it gets so much stronger. Every Friday, I'll send out to my students in the distance learning time, um, a passion project showcase. Through six weeks, I just put a big old directory, like a yellow pages, with a quick blurb about what each student's working on. Roman is fueled by faith. But meanwhile, Tyler is binging Netflix, just writing about the favorite episodes of his favorite TV shows that he was watching. Uh, Sean's getting swole, bro, right? Emma was a baking machine. Different students are working on different things, and that's totally okay. But I'm highlighting like a news feed, like a curation they'd see on TikTok, or like they'd see on Netflix. Hey, here's the latest from so-and-so's episode. And I don't care what they're working on, because they can post Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, or Saturday. But every week, at the end of the week on Sunday, I'm saying, here's what kids worked on this week. Take a look. I'm through the, the entire process again as they solve those Easter eggs, writing quick emails, but then my workflow is much more expedited rather than a big old pile all at once. Students are on a constant rolling basis, turning in things that make sense to them. I had a student who was bummed that the football season was canceled for the XFL, uh, the DC Defenders. So he went online and tried to make a replica of the Audi field in Washington, DC using only Minecraft. It was insane the amount of detail that student put into the project. He probably put in something close to, I want to say, 100 hours to get this to this point. And every week he's sending me Twitch streams of, here's where I am so far. I don't know how to make the, uh, the locker room area because I don't know what that looks like. But I went online and found some videos about what the locker room looked like. So I'm making like a mental note of how to make a locker room and then pulling those same elements in a scale model of uh, my replica, like using Legos online. How cool is that, right? Minecraft is a fantastic tool for Microsoft that lets students play with Legos, even if they're not in the classroom. I had a student who taught me how to speak teenager on the left-hand side. She said, um, Mr. Meehan, you got to get that bread. I have no idea what that means. And so she's posted videos where each week she would walk me through like the top 10 things that teenagers say with like a talking head thing with a dictionary definition. And she became like an influencer. She was laughing and enjoying it. And you can see the faces the students have here, right? They're loving it and they're leaning in and they're sharing with one another. I had another student who watched the entire run of The Office was bored on Netflix and then decided to make a blog where she made cooking recipes inspired by each of the things that she saw in the office. She learned how to make a, a Diwali feast. She talked about Dwight's beets and all the different things we can make with beets, how to make a stapler uh, sit inside of a jello mold and how to make Kevin's famous chili but not spill it on the floor. What a clever and creative thing to let students tap into their passion projects. And then they start to work harder because it doesn't feel like work. This is that first example, which we kicked off for the first four or five weeks. And I think that's what students worked on as their passion project right up through the Easter break. When we came back from it, the NFL moved their draft online um, because it wasn't safe to do it in person. And they said, all right, we're going to do the draft as we normally do, put a team on the clock, let them pick whoever uh, their new picks are. And I said, well, this could be an activity too. I built this one for a history teacher. Uh, and I was like, here we go. Um, Malcolm X was a major civil rights activist. While we're talking about things like Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, that becomes a very real, very controversial topic that makes hard to talk about, especially when we're remote, because we don't have the, sa the same sense of giving that empathy and giving that on-the-spot feedback. So we know it's a nuanced and delicate conversation in the classroom, but it needs to be talked about. So while we're talking about it in a time where the world is talking about civil rights and Black Lives Matter, could we create a, quote, game that does not make light of, but rather makes sense of through playful learning? The same thing as the students are processing. So I said, right, we're making an NFL draft. I made this template on PowerPoint and I sent it on out. And I said, here we go. Uh, working with, again, another teacher who's a history teacher. I said, plug in the details here, just like you were drafting for the NFL. Who's your person? Drop their picture in the background. On the right-hand side, put in four key stats about them. You notice they're blue and underlined. If I roll my mouse over, it's another annotated bibliography. This will take you to Wesleyan EDU. That will take you to MalcolmXBiography.com. 
This one will take you to um, News One, talking about the, the, the history of his assassination in the Nation of Islam. And this one will take you to History.com. Aren't these credible sources? If I ask students to write for me an annotated bibliography with four things or five things, would they raise an eyebrow and say, yeah, I don't care about doing it? It's the same activity, like that game we saw at the beginning, right? Just turn sideways with a different coat of paint. Okay, you have four reasons why you draft Malcolm X as the number one person for your civil rights activist team. Cool, tell me why. Why would you dra draft Malcolm X over Martin Luther King? Put two or three other people. I make a slide deck of four or five slides. Um, who else would you have? Maybe Marcus Garvey, W.E.B. Du Bois. You can have that newsfeed ticker on the bottom. Tensions are increasing between Malcolm X and the nation of Inslaw. Fully editable, and again, this here on the left-hand side even makes a small hist historical reference. It says Civ Right Rev, like Civil Rights Revolution, and the Panthers pick is in. We can see the, the them thematic connections here. Make a thing that makes me smile, make me laugh. You have four or five slides. You can do this that a student has to do individual ones, or you can sign a slide deck to four or five students to collaborate on together. They work together, and then suddenly it's the blue team against the green team against the red team. Draft your best roster and tell me why you would pick what you picked. Each team then turns it in over the course of several days. They're working remotely, asynchronously, texting each other, Snapchatting each other, talking about why it needs to be what it looks like. When they're done, they turn it in. You can then use Flipgrid again, where now they can do head-to-head -head attacks for one another and say, here's why our team is going to crush your team on this field. We have these three great people. They're killing it. It's a debate, right? These people are stronger than your team is because boom, 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 boom. And as each student then posts up a Flipgrid in defense of his or her cause, they can also see the causes that are defended by other students. And as a follow-up assignment through Flipgrid, you can say, all right, pretend like you're an analyst here on ESPN. What draft grade would you give Blue Team? Why? What do they have well? They have a strong offense, but they need a better defense. Maybe they're too gradualist. You need to be a little bit more aggressive. Maybe you need to be more assertive. Maybe Martin Luther King, you know, they're having harder conversations about whether Martin Luther King or Malcolm X's uh, philosophy is the better way to make change happen in a world that they're leaning in. Would you draft a George Floyd before you drafted a Breonna Taylor? Talk about the what's and why's, and that's really strong. You can use the same activity then to draft anybody from any historical thing or any literary thing and say, now tell me the, the five worst characters we read in all of Shakespeare or the three strongest scientists we've encountered in the last six months of study. They're leaning in. There's a rooting interest. There's a vesting interest. And they feel like they're safe and supported because this game is adapting to become harder, not because I made it hard, but because the teammates they're playing against with or the teams that they're playing against are stepping up game because they're using that as an authentic opportunity to bring the best of what they have against the best of their other teams. I closed my year out um, with a novel study. Um, I wasn't able to do a full novel, but I was able to do uh, a modification and do short stories. So I picked the short stories of Flannery O'Connor, who I happen to love. I created this PowerPoint, um, again, send out the template to my students as if it was a out of the box first day uh, of class. Just read the PowerPoint at your leisure. It'll walk you through like a game board, how we're gonna play over the next week of class. This is when we explored the mysteries of sin and salvation, these very weird twisted stories of a beautiful, uh, talented Southern author named Flannery O'Connor. In this search for purpose, I'll send this out and um, I'll say, you know, in the years following the Civil War, Americans were forced to reevaluate everything our nation once held dear. Writers, politicians, and everyday citizens began to confront brutal mistakes of the country's past in hopes to fashion a stronger future. But even though that old South was haunted or dead, many of its ghosts still haunted that world it left behind. We have this search for salvation, which created a perfect storm, giving rise to a literary genre that we call the Southern Gothic. It pulls no punches in exposing that ugly truth behind the agrarian plantation life. And the degree to which the idealized idyllic Old South rested on massive repressions of the region's historical realities. Talk about slavery, classism, and patriarchy. Some of these most shocking and most powerful stories were written by a Catholic woman from Georgia named Flannery O'Connor. And as she explained, whenever I'm asked why Southern writers have such a penchant for writing about freaks, I say it's because we still have the ability to recognize one. Now that feels freakish, that feels weird. Like a Netflix style TV show. We're about to binge watch stories about kids drowning, barns burning and cars rusting. You wanna watch, you wanna lean in, you wanna play? Again, pulling in that same thing, but doing a little bit more of what appears to be almost like a low key direct instruction here, because I'd send this template out and then the template would look like this. All right, here's our board game for the week, guys. You've probably seen similar things online. That step-by-step-by-step -step -step board game would otherwise have been a numbered worksheet. Number one, do this. Number two, do this. Number three, and so on and so forth. But instead, much like a self-paced video game, okay, start at the first square and move your piece forward as you solve each piece along the way. Like the game of Clue, or like the game of Candyland, or like the game of Monopoly, it's very easy to see, oh, once I've solved X, I move to Y. They start by reviewing the story menu, and they vote on which story makes most sense to them. 
because this is a PowerPoint, I can make links to each of the stories just by clicking on any of these icons. And then when they voted on that story, this is the click right back, click right back to the form that'll take their survey information, helping me know which story that each student wants to talk about all week long. From there, I'll embed YouTube videos, just like we saw about the airport uh, and the contagion story, right? Watch to learn a little bit about the Southern Gothic tradition, whether you're watching pro wrestling or Beyonce Knowles, you can click on either of these things and get to that YouTube video and take notes about it. Then read the short story of your choice. Here's a shared document. Go ahead and make your annotations on that shared document. What did you find? What, did you, what were you interested in when you read your story? What were the 10 things that popped up to you? Again, I don't know what they're gonna say, but the, click, the task there is clear because once they have done all four of those stations, they have a chance to join in a Zoom meeting, uh, which is what we did, or in this case, it would be a Teams meeting. And if they're able to be a part of that Teams meeting, they schedule in advance because they wanted to come into that class. Hey, I did steps one through five. I think I'm ready for step six. If they weren't able to do that Teams meeting, I would just send them a, a podcast where they would listen to that instead and make notes just like they made notes on the video. And then a 40 minute Teams meeting turned into a 40 minute podcast where they were just learning and reflecting because they had the sound file of what we had recorded from the group conversation from the day prior. Great, then reflect on it yourself. How did you do? If you had a chance to do it again, what would you do? Come back for an next Zoom meeting um, at the time of your leisure. Set that schedule up on a Sunday and let students move at their own pace. By Tuesday or Wednesday, everyone's expected to have signed up for those online meetings. If I don't hear from them, I shoot them a quick message. Hey, I noticed you haven't signed up, but every student is then joining in and I'm making myself available at times that make sense for me, but also make sense for them. Why should every child have to learn math at 5 p.m. every single day? or at three in the afternoon, you have to take your science class. As long as my schedule is flexible, my school's willing to accept it, I can let them meet on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, because I know in order to do level five work, they had to beat levels one through four, and I could see all that work already in the document. This document is there for them, and again, every student has access to edit his or her own copy. Just click on this space below and reflect on either video that you watched. Tell me where the 10 things that you found that were most interesting, whether you watched Beyonce Knowles or uh, Wyndham Rotunda, who plays the character of Bray Wyatt. Many Harvard, franchises like American Horror Story or The Walking Dead really tap into this Southern Gothic. And now students are starting to see practical applications of the weird, creepy stuff, but also real life applications of things like racism and classism and sexism. So even though I wasn't able to do my proper novel study at the end of the year, everything you're looking at was churned out during the pandemic so my kids could keep learning in the pandemic and that joy and that energy and that learning never stopped. I say at the end that I do want to take questions, um, you know, whether we're in class or whether we're at home, the only thing more powerful than content ownership, which is the thing that I made for them, is content authorship, which is, whoa, you made an awesome thing for me. Giving our students that agency, that creativity to play with that very, very high level taxonomy, right? Creativity and evaluation, that's the top of the Bloom's chart. If we can get our students to do that stuff, they get excited to come in and say, Mr. Meehan, I can't wait to show you what I did. Better yet, forget Mr. Meehan. Hey team, I wanna show everybody in class because I killed it and I can't wait to show the world what I've turned out. That's real, that's relevant, that's rigorous, that's fun, that's exciting. It's based entirely on choice. It's based entirely on student agency. And that's how we can change the game, whether we're in person or remote. At this time, I do wanna pause, take some questions, but I wanted to say before I turn my screen back to just my bald head and my beard, um, I have templates all available of everything you saw here today under the distance learning tab on adrenalinerush.com. I do a weekly podcast. It's called Talk to Me in the Car every Monday where I talk about education, all things teaching related and education inspired. And I typically would record it on my drive back from work as a high school instructional coach. Um, but now I just record it in my neighborhood when I'm on my walks. Um, I have a book, it's called Adrenaline Rush. It's available from Dave Burgess Consulting. It's all about game-changing student engagement inspired by theme parks, mud runs, and escape rooms. I don't think it sucks, but you can check out the first chapters online on Amazon. And if you think it's cool, hit me up, shoot me a message. I'm on Twitter at MeehanEDU. I use the hashtag Adrenaline. And I will gladly talk about this or anything else that may be of note or interest to you when we're online. Um, whatever I can do to help, I tell the students I have no life and no friends. So I'm all into geek about education. Whatever you need to do, I'm here for it. Again, copies are available, templates uh, on adrenalinerush.com. And I wanna say thank you for giving me some time today because I hate it when people waste my time or my money. I said we go an hour, we are right up at the hour mark. If you need to bounce, I totally understand. But at this time, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna answer whatever questions are there in the chat. And um, I'll hang out as long as we need to to make sure that everybody has um, their questions taken care of. All right, let's get stop that sharing and then we're gonna get back to me. Let's do this. Let's do this now, cameraman. All right, here we go. Camera. I think I'm on. There we go. All right, awesome, 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 awesome. 
Um, I want to take a moment, scroll back through and see if I can see anything examples uh, that people need to talk about. If I miss something, feel free to put it over here in the message on the bottom right hand side. I'm all in to do anything I can to help out answer any questions here. Um, I'm clicking for new messages here. Um, Okay, I'm going to go up and see uh, when last I saw it. I, I want to make sure I'm answering every question. And again, if you need to bounce, I totally understand it. Do not take it personally. Uh, people see stuff. Hey, hooray. Uh, yeah, uh, his name is Mihai Cheeks and Mihai. That one's hard, and I'm really uh, pretty, pretty uh, conscientious about how to make sure that I say names properly um, from any background. Um, but yeah, his name is hard. Mihai Cheeks and Mihai. Um, Jeremy says, makes sense. I get how failure drives learning in his show. Engage. Oh, cool. I'll link here on YouTube. I'll definitely check that out. Um, if you have uh, access, go ahead and give a click there. I'll have access to all of this chat afterwards here too. Um, talk about investment, about uh, uh, the in investment on a goal and a task. Talk about a Z-level access. Um, favorite game ever. The game pandemic is great. Uh, it is an awesome, awesome game. And the idea of playing together. Oh, Jeremy made a video about that. Fantastic. So cool. If you haven't played pandemic, it's a great chance to play together with friends. And it doesn't turn into a monopoly fight where you're trying to beat the people in the room with you. Rather, you're working with them, which is awesome. Um, let's see here. Legacy version of pandemic is fantastic. I agree. Looking at that here. No more desk groups at school, but you can absolutely have them online. 100% agree, Becca. Um, I can say, all right, blue team. Those are these four students who are not allowed to touch hands, but are still allowed to work in the same shared document. And you can use any of the Microsoft suites to make that happen or the Google Drive, which is super awesome because then they still feel a sense of camaraderie, even if they can't do quite fist bumps. Um, Jerry's talking about the podcast, uh, talking about Watch Your Lyrics. It is great um, cutting out of students' uh, favorite songs uh, and lyrics, a great way to play with it. And again, you can use Flipgrid for things that are more robust than just record your lyrics, right? They can do anything you want to. Are the Google Slides easy to change into Microsoft PowerPoint? They are. Um, and privately, I will tell you that I love both of these products. Um, we are being recorded, and Microsoft did a fantastic job of setting this event up. So I will say that there is nothing uh, wrong with either of their products. It is a Coke and Pepsi thing. There's a little bit of a difference between them. Um, I have my proclivities to which ones I use on any given nature. But yeah, very, very easy. You just push the button, and um, it's click and play. And you can, again, save copies available from the website. You can download and convert just about anything here. Um, Jessica said she started uh, editing one for her first units. Awesome, so cool. Um, the Edflix idea. Yes, 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 yes. Taking the steps for Edflix, uh, they called Enterprise Time. Basically a genius hour during the school day. One million percent, right? We're talking about portfolios. This is a student showcase where they get to brag about the thing that they've been working on. And then they make it as if it is presented for a TV show that is must watch. That's something our students understand. They've been doing that, whether it's Disney Plus or Hulu, it's Hamilton or it's Tiger King. They're going home getting so geeked out about Floor is Lava. Cool. And make your own version of whatever your thing is, your own fitness craze. Talk about it. Go. And I watch students get really excited. It's portfolios with a bit of a presentation, sort of like Montessori school on steroids. Um, that showcase is great, um, and they're really exciting. And again, I picked some of the pretty ones, but I'll tell you, I had 40 different students turn in all sorts of stuff because I do split my time between it, instructional coaching uh, for half the day and my teaching for the other half. And they are excited, so it makes it a joy to come back and grade those things. Um, I really appreciate it. And Dave said, this is rich and easy. Hey, thanks so much. You got it, brother. Um, thanks, Erica. Thank you, uh, Monique. This is so cool. Thanks, guys. Um, yes, Tesla versus Edison. What do you think about it? Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a great board game. Uh, and the fact that we could then have students pick a side by choosing X, they've unchosen Y, and creating a debate-style activity where they're fired up with a rooting interest. Hey, it has to be Coke, or it has to be Pepsi. It has to be change the name of the Washington football team, or it has to be the Buffalo Bills up against the New England Patriots, right? That sense of collegiality, that sport is a lot of fun. It's really easy, as Sarah says, to engage um, for many, many students. Um, linking to the reflect, uh, Ms. Daniel says, for the reflect, important. Yes, so ready uh, for that back to school remotely. It can be fun. It doesn't have to suck. Flipgrid is an awesome free tool for educators that Microsoft acquired, I think, two summers ago. It is beautiful. It is great. And it is elegant that students understand it because it feels like a safe and protected environment where they and only their classmates will have access to those videos. And there's a good chance because they know that they're going to be seen, that they want to try it and do it well. Even for students who are shy, they can use a sock puppet, black the screen out and just do a voice, just talk. Um, they don't have to always feel comfortable putting themselves in front of the camera, but by doing the work time and time and time again, they start to feel safer and more supported as they move forward through it. So um, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Monique. Um, thanks, Jamie. I really appreciate it, y'all. Uh, thanks, Ms. Walker. Um, oh, these are all really nice things. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Sarah. Um, thanks, Ann. Um, says, oh, just a whole bunch of thank yous. Guys, you're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
I really appreciate it. Um, like I said, mental health is real and that we're saying nice things to each other really does help you know that you're not alone, right? I would not show up and put this work in if I did not have people looking at the work. So thank you. You guys, are every bit as, as vital as this operation. Um, and as I said, you have to bounce. I understand we said we go an hour. We've just gone uh, just, just a little uh, five minutes worth of that too. Um, or the book in Germany. Hooray. Awesome. Thanks, Doc. I appreciate it. Uh, parents often want to know how things are going to be graded. Do I prepare a rubric for every assignment? That is a great question. On my website, I mean, I didn't talk about it um, here in the doc. I typically have um, a lot of self-grading and a lot of self-reflection. So students are um, looking at their own effort and saying, here's how I did in relation to how I've done in the past or how I've done in relation to the average class uh, progress. Here's how I feel my grade is and where it is and why it is. A lot of metacognition in that. And there's a lot of research to suggest um, that the person who's doing the reflection is the person who's doing the learning. If I just arbitrarily give them a B or a C or an A or a D, even if I have a rationale behind it, they have a hard time interacting with the why behind it. So what I'll often do is give them the feedback only and say, based on this feedback and this exemplar that we're looking against, right? We have a rubric or a template. Where do you see yourself succeeding? Where do you see yourself soaring? Where do you see yourself struggling? What can I do to help? I have those templates available on my website. You might find on the link, it's called the spider web rubric or the personal record rubric. Really, really helpful to help students engage deeper. And you can download copies of that. It's all on the website for sure. Um, thanks for the idea. A recording of the session should be available later. Yes, I believe so on the Microsoft CUE webpage. Um, it might take a minute. I think they have a YouTube channel that stores these things all for forever. So I appreciate it here. Thanks, Trisha. It's really great seeing you. I hope you're well. I hope you're safe. Um, is pandemic appropriate for grades four and five? Um, good question. And I have my print copy of the game kicking around here somewhere. I think if you have uh, what I would call me in a fifth grade, like a nerdy kid, a kid who kind of geeks out about science and math and English and reads a bunch of books. Like when I was in high school, I was reading Michael Crichton books like Jurassic Park. I loved it. But I started reading that stuff after I read like Stephen King books in middle school. Um, I was a weird kid. That kid, I think, was totally ready to play Pandemic, really excited about it. Um, there is like a junior version of it um, that helps the students get a, a bit of a handle on it. But there's no death. It's just about outbreaks. It's about numbers. It's about math. Um, so if that sounds like something that's of interest to you, uh, definitely check it out. You can check out the reviews on Amazon. Um, and again, that same Pandemic theme could easily be, OK, we're a team of researchers exploring the world rather than solving a disease. So a quick coat of paint could change that, too, here. Uh, Todd says, issues getting buy-in at the beginning of the year. A 90% failure rate for quarter four because kids just wouldn't do anything or interact. Yeah, I think the matter of giving students choice and autonomy early really can help lock them in. Now, I know a lot of schools were making up as they went last year, which did create a whole bunch of challenges as we started out. But I want to go back and say, if I gave you a Netflix style kickoff to the year, hey, who are you as a person on your market set? Go. There is no reason to not engage in that activity, especially if I'm checking in with you regularly. I get to know you that much more deeply by the work that you're sharing, by the projects that you're creating. And then I get to be really excited to tap into that flow, stay with you and say, hey, good job. Have you also thought about X, right? Like a counselor in a school, hey, you're doing a great job with Y. Have you considered Z? That really helps people to move through here. Um, so feel free to check that out. It's like I said, it's on the website. Jessica said, did I already talk about how to get the Netflix template? I missed it. No pressure. It's under the distance learning tab on adrenalinerush.com. Feel free to head to that and grab a copy for yourself. Snag it, save it, and make it any way you need to for you, which is awesome. Jamie says, on oh, my student showcase, I picked a handful of students to showcase. Do I put them all up to showcase so they can see everyone's work? Yes, and is the answer, Jamie. Each week, I'll highlight five or ten, like uh, the best of, the greatest. But once every couple of weeks, I throw them back into the let's see everyone's. Also on our LMS, we're having a constant ongoing discussion about in order to get the grade for this week, you have to turn in one post or two posts a piece, which also have to link to or look at someone else's. So we have the whole directory posted there, sort of behind closed doors. Just once a week, we post it out to families as well. And I, I like to give some kids some shine. So if I know they had a rough week or if they know they were going through it, I try to really put the spotlight on them because then they feel like, hey, I can do this. They start to believe in themselves, which is great. Um, Jessica asked that question, can I talk about a setting uh, the game situation in a safe way? When it comes to studying a novel, no, you are not a slave, right? Yeah, 100%. Um, I think it's very careful. Um, and I teach American literature. I teach Huckleberry Finn. Uh, I teach The Scarlet Letter, talking about bullying, blaming, shaming, racism, uh, the N-word. I don't shy away from hard things. Uh, we talk about uh, William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, as an example, um, which is a book about, uh, you know, trauma. And there's, there's, there's elements of psychosis and there's elements of sexuality in there. And it's really challenging. So I'm very careful not to ever put my students in a position where they're forced in any way to role play or empathize with an aggressor or 
that we minimize or trivial, trivialize the plight of a person who is persecuted. Because if you create or reduce it to a game, I think the um, the the ADL is very clear. They have a great uh, proposition paper about uh, like the Holocaust or um, simulation games about slavery. You accidentally reduce someone's real life trauma to some sort of trivial, well, you should have decided X. And if you only would have decided X, you would have been safe. It makes us start to feel like these people were too stupid to decide for themselves to do the right thing. So in creating game-based scenarios, I'll tap into a lot of playful learning elements, but I won't put them in a position ever where they're forced to save the slaves or ask the best solution for the Underground Railroad. Instead, I'll use playful elements of game design to bring them to the world of X. So for example, welcome to the world of Huckleberry Finn. We have to gather supplies for our trip down the river. Before we do that, we need to learn a little bit about four or five or 10 different things. So it becomes a supply race game where they, I don't know, grab the raft, right? Or they grab the, 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 the food that they'll need for the trip, or they grab a, a gunny sack or whatever they're uh, carrying over their, 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 their shoulder. Um, different collectible items themed around the story of Huckleberry Finn. So they become familiar with stuff like uh, home tack and gunny sack and rafts, like words that would be uh, familiar in the language of Huckleberry Finn. So it's a vocabulary game really, but, as they solve for X, they've earned the right to add that item to their inventory to stock up their raft for what's going to be a big old trip down the river. So maybe as they learn about the Mississippi River, they learn a little bit about the history of the place, take some notes on a YouTube video, and they earn, quote, the raft item or the raft badge. Meanwhile, at the Pone Tack, they learn about the food of the day or the time of the sort of cultures of the time, learning about Southern aristocracy, like uh, what it looks like, who does the cooking. They're not scoring points at the expense of people who are ever persecuted, but they are interacting with elements drawn from that universe or that world so that we can save the real hard conversation for, okay, you've packed the, the raft full of all of these things. Then we dial in for that Socratic seminar or that Zoom meeting or that Teams meeting to say, let's talk about the hard stuff now, right? That other stuff is very low level, very easy. It's all gather all up. Once you have all those things gathered, you've earned the right to take part in those harder conversations. And really being empathetic and present for those conversations can be really, really helpful. Um, Jeremy says he used the uh, pandemic as Leon in third grade. Awesome, 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 awesome. Talking about uh, pandemic game, you can grab on, um, on my website, uh, the online version of it that I made for my class under the distance learning tab here. Uh, but there's also uh, the Z-Man Games website is amazing. Um, it's also on Xbox. Oh, snap. Well, that's cool. <laughs> uh, thank you, Todd. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Ms. Daniels. I appreciate that, too. Um, People say they got to bounce. I totally understand. Like, will not take it personally. I've been taking up way too much of your time. If you have to bounce, uh, please, please, please do it. Um, let's see here. I'm seeing other examples here. Helps to start the year with intention, give an insight as to what everyone's learning about, and with them, without embarrassing as names are not attached. For sure, people will get excited hearing about it, and they want to share. Yep, I completely agree with that too. And I think that's a great way to start the year off. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. I'm going to hang out. I will answer questions as you need to. If you need to go offline, I totally understand. If you want to ask a question and now it won't be recorded. That'd say, okay, fine too. But I want to say thank you for your time. Stay safe, wear a mask, stay home. Um, God bless you. Please hit me up on Twitter. Anything I can do to help, I am all in. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's session. I'm going to stop the recording now. I'm going to hang out with you online.